Okay, we're out on the street again. And uh, last video I know I said I was going to uh, be out tomorrow filming and uh, that didn't, uh, didn't actually work out that way. The weather was, weather was kind of bad a couple days in a row and um, decided to just hang around, hang around the apartment, do a little uh, housekeeping, cleaning up, did some laundry. What am I talking about? Y'all you, you, don't care about this. Where are we today? Today, we are outside of the British Embassy. See it right there. We're outside of the British Embassy. Why are we outside of the British Embassy? Well, because today, we are going to try and talk about the, um, the relationship between Argentina and Britain. And it is a very long and storied relationship. Um, the history goes way back. Uh, the relationship right now is not great. Um, there is still a bit of beef over the Malvinas Islands, the Falkland Islands, if you ask a British person. Uh, and that's the, uh, the place where a war was fought. A very brief war, but a war nonetheless. Um, back in uh, 1982. Um, and the, the thing about the uh, relationship between Argentina and, and Great Britain is it's been up and down uh, for, for you know, hundreds of years. Sometimes they have a great, great relationship. Sometimes they're fighting wars with each other. And more recently, um, the relationship has been a little bit strained. The uh, current prime, uh, or I'm sorry, current uh, president-elect of Argentina, Javier Millet, has uh, stayed true to the claim that the Malvinas are Argentine, that they should remain uh, Argentine, and that Argentina has sovereignty over them. And in response, Rishi Sunak, the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, has uh, made a counterclaim that they belong to uh, the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom has sovereignty over them. And caught in the middle of this for the last 40 years or so, well, even longer than that, but caught in the middle are the people who actually live in the Falkland Islands, who are overwhelmingly of British descent. They, uh, they speak English, and in a... Uh, the most recent referendum they had, about 10 years ago, uh, they overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly decided that they want to remain um, a British protectorate. I think it was like 98 or 99% uh, of the residents, which uh, the residents there, there's only about 3,500 people living on that island, or those two islands. Um, but it's still a hot button issue. But uh, we're gonna go around, we'll see some uh, different places of historical significance to the relationship between uh, between England or the British and uh, and uh, the people of Argentina and we'll talk a little bit more about the history because like I said it is a long and storied history of ups and downs good times bad times and uh, actually some wars so uh, we're gonna head over to the uh, soup taste stop came all the way here just to film the intro in front of the British Embassy, but that's not really where we're going to be today. We're going to be around different places, so we'll head back to the soup tay. And uh, when I came off the soup tay, there's actually some sort of protest march happening over here, so uh, you may actually hear some of that. But uh, we'll catch you soon. So right out here, in front of Estación Retiro. Retiro train station where we were when we went to Barrio Chino, right across the street here. Torre Monumental, the Monumental Tower. And this tower was actually built by British Argentines uh, in 1910 as a uh, like a celebration for the centennial of Argentine independence in 1810. This area was uh, was an area where a lot of British Argentines lived. And at the time that this was built, the uh, relationship between Argentina and Britain was uh, very, very good. It was uh, at the tail end of, I would say, I don't know, probably like 40 or 50 years worth of a, of a really, really good relationship, diplomatically, economically. Um, in fact, between like 1860, 1865, and uh, the beginning of World War II in 1914, 
the relationship was great. I mean, it was really great. There was a lot of uh, exports of uh, agriculture, beef especially, and grain from Argentina to the United Kingdom or to Brit Great Britain. And uh, there was a lot of capital flowing in from Britain. Uh, enough capital to <laughs> be able to build giant towers like this. And also train stations like that one and Plaza Constitucion where we, uh, where we typically pass through every day. And uh, that, cap that kind of capital, uh, in fact there was more capital uh, flowing in from the United Kingdom or from uh, Great Britain during that time uh, than there was from Great Britain to India during that time. So that'll give you an idea of how much, um, you know, how close the relationship was. And so, uh, so this tower was built and of course it used to be called Torre de Inglesias, the Tower of the English. But uh, after the, uh, the Falkland Malvinas conflict, that all changed. And they renamed it the Torre Monumental. Because after the end of the Falkland conflict, uh, the United Kingdom and uh, Argentina, they broke off uh, diplomatic relations. They broke off diplomatic relations for uh, about uh, seven years, I believe, until 1989. And uh, after that, they reinstituted diplomatic relations and they've sort of been healing the wounds of the Malvinas Falklands conflict um, ever since. You can actually hear the bell ringing uh, up at the top of the tower. There's a clock up there and the bell still rings. It's currently noon. And there is very, very close by here, and we're gonna walk over there, a uh, monument to the fallen uh, of the Malvinas conflict. We talk a little bit more about the Malvinas conflict, but uh, just wanted to show you this tower just so you know that there really was a very, very strong relationship between Britain and, uh, and Argentina for many, many years. Now, after uh, World War I and World War II, um, Juan Perón, whose grave we saw in, uh, in a previous video, he actually uh, nationalized a lot of businesses that, uh, and industries that were previously owned by the British. And that didn't go over too well with the British. So the relationship did sour a bit uh, for the years while he was in power. Uh, but again, back in uh, 1965, when he was in exile, uh, the, they started um, negotiations between the United Kingdom and, uh, and Argentina to figure out the situation with Las Malvinas, or the Falkland Islands. Who's gonna have sovereignty? What's the future of the islands going to be? And uh, as we walk over this way, uh, through this little plaza here, we're gonna head across the street. This is uh, Avenue, Avenida Libertador, Liberator Avenue, I believe. And we gotta find a place to cross this. Um, and then right on the other side, is the uh, monument that I mentioned to the fallen, uh, the fallen soldiers of the Malvinas conflict. But uh, in 1965, they, uh, there were negotiations beginning uh, for who, what was the future of the Malvinas going to be. And both, both sides claim sovereignty over them and have claimed sovereignty going all the way back to the early 1800s. Um, and what, what happened was uh, both, basically both countries had started to move towards the right politically, uh, leading into the late 70s and into the 80s, especially in Argentina. Now in Argentina, uh, they moved very far to the right. Uh, there was a military dictatorship the uh, military dictatorship that deposed 
uh, former president Isabel Perón, who is Juan Perón's third wife, who assumed the presidency after Perón's death. And uh, they, um, let me find a place to cross the street here and try not to get run over. Actually, you know what? We're gonna have to focus on this because there's a lot of traffic, so I'll catch you back in a second. All right, found a nice, quiet, shady spot on the bench in the, uh, in the plaza. And the monument is actually uh, right behind me. You can see it over my shoulder there. And uh, what I was saying is in the, in the lead up to the conflict in 1982, uh, the governments of both, um, uh, of both countries had been shifting uh, to the right, uh, especially in Argentina. There was a military dictatorship and uh, they had been in power for about five or six years. And uh, their power was, uh, well, it was fleeting. And uh, revolution was, you know, in the air. Uh, the people were not happy. They were not happy with the dictatorship. And in, in, in sort of a, a bid to, uh, to maintain power, they used the war as a distraction, as basically a uh, nationalist um, uh, sort of a symbol of nationalism where they could like unite the people around one goal which is to reclaim the Malvinas from occupiers or at least that's how they saw it. Now on the uh, British side it just was an invasion. It was uh, you know since they claimed sovereignty uh, they saw it as an invasion of their sovereign territory. But uh, on the Argentine side the junta, the military junta, they didn't think that the British were going to do anything. They figured they would just occupy the territory and uh, that would be it, fait accompli, and the British would not do anything. Well, uh, Margaret Thatcher, the new Prime Minister of the uh, United Kingdom at the time, she had a different plan, and uh, she sent a flotilla of ships, including an aircraft carrier, um, along with, uh, with uh, intelligence support and logistical support from the United States. She sent uh, the aircraft carrier and, uh, and a, uh, a bunch of troops um, down to, uh, to retake the island. Now, the actual fighting really only lasted for about three weeks. The total time of the conflict is actually a couple of months because uh, in order to get the flotilla down there, to get the flotilla assembled and get it down there to the islands, it took some time. Um, probably about a month, or a little over a month. And, um, what, what's, uh, what's really interesting about it is the, up until that point, the United Kingdom, they really didn't want the, to maintain sovereignty over the islands. They were trying to come up with a plan uh, to, uh, to lease back the, uh, the islands, essentially the same way they had done um, with uh, Hong Kong and China. A plan where eventually, after a certain amount of time, the islands would return to Argentina because it uh, it's expensive defending um, a small uh, set of islands with only 3,500 people on them. Um, that that is so far away from your home country. It's 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 expensive to defend it, and that is actually the argument today uh, by the labor most people in the Labor Party uh, in the United Kingdom that we really they really shouldn't be defending uh, the Falklands, and the only reason that the conservatives in, uh, in the United Kingdom are, are uh, continuing to claim sovereignty and continuing to want to defend uh, the Falklands is because it's their last, uh, the Falklands War was like their last um, moment of military glory uh, of the Empire. I don't want to talk too much over this because, you know, this of course is a monument uh, to uh, fallen soldiers of a war. So when we get over there, going to stop talking. I am going to film it. Um, but when we do get over there, there are uh, a couple of uh, guards, uh, military who stand guard in front of the monument. And uh, it just shows uh, the names of all the people uh, who died on the Argentine side in the conflict. So let's take a look.
there you can see the outline of the Malvinas, Falkland Islands. And above where these soldiers are standing, it says, A los caidos en las gesta de las Islas Malvinas y Atlantico Sur. Which, uh, if I believe if I'm translating correctly, means to the fallen of the conflict of the Malvinas Islands and the South Atlantic. As I mentioned before, the current president-elect, Javier Millet, um, has said, uh, he's been given mixed messages, sort of. Um, he has said that he does believe that Argentina has sovereignty over the islands, but that he does not believe that a military solution is the, solu is the way to go, that the, they should be returned to Argentina, but through diplomatic means. Uh, Rishi Sunak, the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, a conservative, uh, has said that no, the United Kingdom maintains sovereignty and they will continue to maintain sovereignty. Basically saying that there will be no uh, discussions about it. Now, a funny thing is um, uh, Millet, who is an economic uh, libertarian, uh, his economic beliefs um, are a lot very similar actually to Margaret Thatcher. And he has in the past praised Margaret Thatcher, which is kind of not a thing that you do um, in Argentina. Uh, that's she's she is persona non grata in Argentina. But he he has he has praised her. So like I said, he's been giving sort of mixed messages um, about what he thinks the future of Las Malvinas uh, are going to be. But in in like Argentine modern popular culture, you can tell that. Um, that the, the Argentine people, they, they still believe that the Malvinas are Argentinas. And uh, you see signs. I mean, there is a sign. I saw a sign on the train uh, that was, you know, by, from the Department of Transportation that said, uh, Las Malvinas son Argentinas. And I've seen, uh, I saw like an advertisement um, uh, from like a, some sort of drink company talking about how Patagonia, which is the southern part of Argentina, you know, off the coast of Patagonia, that's where the islands are. That something to the effect of, uh, you know, like the Malvinas are your Patagonia, meaning, you know, the the official stance here is that uh, the islands uh, belong to Argentina. And like I said before, caught in the middle of all this are about 3,500 people who actually live on those islands who uh, 10 years ago decided overwhelmingly that they want to still be uh, a British protectorate. And I can't imagine that in the last 10 years uh, that has changed very much. So, um, so like I said, it's a, it's a bit of a sticky situation. The current relationship is not, uh, not the best. It's not the worst that it's ever been. It's definitely not the best that it's ever been. And, um, you know, we, we've been talking about since 1865 the relationship but it's actually goes back um, it goes back further than that and uh, I did on on one of my first days here see uh, a church the Iglesia de uh, Ignacio de Loyola which is a church from way back in like the 1700s it's the first Catholic church um, uh, in Argentina I mean it's it's very 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 old and out in front, there's a plaque, and it, it, it says that uh, that the the church was used as a bastion of defense during the um, the first uh, invasion of the English, or the second invasion of the English, one of the invasions of the English. Both of those were right around the same time during the Napoleonic Wars, 1806-1807. Uh, the Spanish, uh, who controlled this area as a as a as a colony at the time, had sided with the French in the Napoleonic Wars. So they were uh, fighting Napoleonic Wars against Great Britain. Um, and the English actually invaded. Uh, they invaded in 1806 and again in 1807. And just a few years after that, in 1810, uh, the war for Argentine independence uh, occurred and, and Argentina eventually became independent uh, from Spain and 
the United Kingdom or the Great Britain at the time, they um, they were officially neutral in that conflict. But given the history, the, mo the very recent history of their uh, their fight with Spain, um, you could see how they were uh, likely hoping that uh, that Argentina would actually become independent. Throughout the whole 1800s, uh, it was a time of uh, colonization, lots of colonial wars popping up here and there, civil wars, wars for independence, um, and the colonial powers of France, Spain, and, uh, and England were on both sides of that. So, for example, in 1823, the uh, Great Britain uh, recognized the independence of Argentina, and it seemed like relationship was headed in the right direction. And then during the Uruguayan Civil War, which lasted for like 60 years basically, a really long series of conflicts in the area, um, uh, the English were on the other side of the war from the Argentine Confederation at the time. The Argentine Confederation is just a loose um, confederation of different former colonies in this area, and it's the government that basically predated the current uh, Argentine government so our system of government, the current constitution, with a president. There's no president, the Argentine con uh, con uh, Confederation. And uh, one of the things that I was able to experience here, just the day after the presidential election, was the Day of National Sovereignty here in Argentina. And that, actually, um, is celebrating a battle that happened between a French and English combined force uh, attempting to sail up the Paraná River, and the battle was between that force and the Argentine Confederation. So even though Argentina, um, you know, Great Britain had recognized their independence, and they had a relatively good relationship, uh, they still fought a battle, <laughs> and it was over trade rights and the um, the fact that the British and the French were attempting to bypass. Buenos Aires and trade further upriver without uh, paying taxes to uh, to the Argentine Confederation. And the result of the battle was um, the flotilla was able to make it past the blockade, but they took so much damage that they realized it would be pointless to continue to try to run blockades against the Argentine Confederation. And a few years later, they recognized the sovereignty of the Argentine Confederation over its internal waters, its internal rivers, and uh, from that point they had to, um, you know, they had to like, uh, continue, uh, hold on one second. Okay, that guy was trying to sell me some socks, we'll probably cut that part out. I don't even remember what I was talking about, what were we talking about? Uh, Well, I've completely lost my train of thought now because of that dude. I guess we'll cut all of this. So we'll take one last look at the monument over here. And then next we're gonna head out to uh, a neighborhood uh, that is out along the Retiro train line. And uh, it's a neighborhood where a lot of um, English um, uh, Argentines used to live and you can still see the architecture uh, the houses in that neighborhood look very very English so um, it'll be fun to see those you can check those out uh, but let's go over we'll take one last look here and there's a looks like there's a tour group coming up on the uh, on the monument here so I'm gonna sneak in ahead of them and we'll try and get one last look here at the, uh, the monument to the fallen of the Malvinas conflict. Oh, and here we go. There's a little QR code on this screen right here, so give you a chance to pause the video if you want. You can scan the QR code and get a little more uh, a little more information about the monument. This is at Retiro Station, 
and you can see everywhere you look there are signs of uh, of uh, Great Britain that's uh, this girder from Liverpool you see all the steel work in here this whole station it's all uh, it's all British and the uh, the hydraulic stops at the end of the train track also British same uh, in Plaza Constitucion in that train station so you can really see um, how during that period from the you know 1860s up until the early 1900s um, Great Britain contributed a lot to the industrialization of, uh, of Argentina especially here in Buenos Aires okay disclaimer for this next part uh, I'm going to really, really offend a lot of people, I'm sure, because I am being very liberal with the terms British, English, Irish, United Kingdom, and such. Uh, the time period I'm talking about is a time when Ireland was, uh, was not independent. This is before Irish independence. And I'm going to just interchange terms, you know, like saying, oh, look, this was founded by someone who was Irish and this looks like it's very English and blah, 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 blah. But I mean, can you blame me? Like, I'm a dumb American. Look at that face. Look at that face. That's the face of a dumb American. So uh, sorry, bruv. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to piss you off. OK, so we're here in the neighborhood of Coughlin. I believe it's Coughlin. Anyway, it's neighborhood was originally founded by a gentleman, John Coughlin, from uh, Ireland. You can see right over here, we're at the train station. And uh, this neighborhood has a lot of architecture that is very uh, British, to say the least. The train station itself is a historical monument that is preserved. Um, you can see as we walk through here, the, the weather has changed also it uh, it rained now it's overcast and uh, and uh, it's pretty pretty chilly getting a little more chilly which actually feels pretty nice um, but it's very I don't know I've never been to England but it seems like a very very English kind of uh, kind of a day out here so it's perfect time for us to come and visit uh, the train station here at Coughlin so this is this old uh, like I said historic Monument train station. You can walk through here. See the old, uh, the old ticket counters. And out on the other side here, I'm hoping we can get a nice view of the whole station. Get a little further away. We can turn the camera around and take a look behind me. Yeah, look at that. It's a cool station. This whole neighborhood uh, looks and feels very, very different than the other uh, neighborhoods that I've been to so far in Buenos Aires. It's one of the things I really like about Buenos Aires. The different neighborhoods all feel very different. They have a very different um, aesthetic and you, you really know when you're in a different neighborhood. But I mean, look at this. It's got all these cool old looking lamp posts. Station looks like it has a little like garden next to it. Anyway, it's very, very cool station. Very, uh, very British looking station, I think. But uh, we're gonna walk up here and just take a little look around the neighborhood. Let's see what we got going on. These cool uh, cobblestone streets all around this neighborhood, from uh, from what I've been told and the research that I've done about the neighborhood. And also, I think there are uh, yeah, see, cobblestone. I think there are a lot of uh, older sort of um, uh, like like s houses that are sort of like single houses that look very uh, very British they have an old sort of British um, architecture style 
yeah, this the architecture here looks very different. You can see this this building right across the street. And uh, this neighborhood has a lot of character, but the yeah, this was this was founded, I guess, by uh, I think uh, Coughlin, if I remember correctly from the research. He uh, purchased the land out here in order to extend the Mitre rail line that we just rode in on. Oh yeah, look at this. Look at this building right here. So he extended the 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 rail line out here, and uh, they named the uh, they named the town after him. And of course, now it's part of Buenos Aires. It's a neighborhood called Coughlin. It's pretty quiet, very sleepy. It is a it is a Sunday, so. Uh, and of course, everything in Buenos Aires is a little sleepier on Sundays. But yeah, you can see all this architecture. You can definitely see the British influence here in this neighborhood. And it's something uh, that definitely, <laughs> that dog is quite excited that I'm here. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely something where you can see the, uh, the long history and the influence um, from Great Britain on Argentina, especially in Buenos Aires. I mean, walking along this street, I'm not going to lie. I've never been, like I said, to England, but this place, this does not feel like Argentina. <laughs> With the, the drizzle and the overcast skies, it feels a lot more like walking along uh, an English street. Of course, we're gonna do what we always do in a new neighborhood. Uh, we'll take a look around, of course, but we're also gonna try and find a cafe because I want coffee and a few media lumas. So we'll go find that and then uh, we'll check back in. Okay, so, so mission accomplished. We found this nice little cafe here. Uh, and it was, it was interesting because I was, uh, I was walking, oh, hold on, there's a train. Train coming through pretty loud. I was walking around on uh, where I thought I was gonna go when I had looked at like maps ahead of time. Uh, but it turns out I was on the other side of the train station from where I thought I was gonna go. And uh, I wanted to find a cafe, but I didn't know if there were any around on this side of the train station. So there's this guy walking along the street. I just asked him, hey, you know, if, do you know if there's a cafe around here? And he started thinking, and he said, well, there's one over here, but it's closed because it's Sunday, and there's another one here. And then he just said, oh, okay, like, come with me. <laughs> and so, so we get to walking. I start talking to him. Turns out his name is Martin Iman, and uh, he runs a, a bakery. A bakery and, like, a cake uh, catering service. It's actually right in this building right here. And... Uh, I looked for a website, but I didn't see one, but I can put a link to, like, uh, the Google Maps entry down in the description in case anybody's ever in Buenos Aires and they need, like, a catering, you know, for, like, a cake or something. Uh, but he's a really nice guy, and uh, I've noticed this happens a lot in Buenos Aires. So you, you just talk to someone on the street and ask them, you know, a quick question or something. Where is this? Do you know if there's uh, one of these around or something like that? And uh, you get... Uh, you usually get a person like that who will just, uh, you know, not only will they show you where it is, they'll walk you all the way over. I mean, he walked me over to this cafe a few blocks away, and uh, he uh, he actually, like, introduced me to the people working at the cafe. So, super nice, really nice guy. And uh, like I said, if you're looking for, um, I guess if you're looking for a cake or bakery catering or something for an event or whatnot in... Uh, in Buenos Aires. Check them out. Martini Man. I'll put the link, like I said, to Google Maps down in uh, down in the uh, description. But, mission accomplished. We got our Café con Leche. We got uh, a 
delicious couple of media lunas and go back across the tracks here now this is a train line there's actually a train spur right up that way so the line we're crossing here is not the line that we were on um, we're gonna go back to the station just a few blocks and from the station we can actually cross there's a little footbridge where we can cross over and uh, check out the other side of the neighborhood because most of the neighborhood actually I think is on the other side of the train station so uh, we'll go ahead and do that and uh, we'll uh, we'll check in again once we get onto the other side of the train station so just as we were going going through trying to get back to the train station I found this little area right here I mean come on look at this this looks like this could be like right out of a little little village somewhere in England and I think we could actually get down uh, some stairs here yeah yeah it looks like there's a ramp it goes back down to the train station from here there's a little park got a dog friend here hello friend that one's got a collar so that means he's someone's dog he or she head back over to the train station here Still drizzling a little bit, very overcast, but much, much cooler than it has been the last few days, which is really nice. It's nice when it's real hot and humid out, you walk around so much, it's just miserable. But uh, today, it's nice and cool, and I'm okay with it being a little drizzly and overcast. If it's nice and cool, it's in like the high 60s right now, so it's perfect. Perfect weather for walking around a neighborhood like this. Here we are, back at the uh, the train station. Hola, buen día. Hola, buen día. Back at the old train station, where we were before. Cut back through, uh, well actually, let's see. Oh, now here's something. Uh, it's Sunday, so this is all closed, unfortunately, but there is like a little, little mini library. Biblioteca Popular. Popular. Um, and I guess like a little mini museum too inside, which uh, I don't think is open on Sundays. But I had read that um, that there is like a little like a curator or a librarian slash curator, and she knows a lot about the area. So it's too bad we came here on Sunday. We maybe could have met her, but if you're ever through here and you want to. Uh, learn a little bit more. Maybe you can talk to her if you speak Spanish. So here's a footbridge. We can head up over here, go to the other side, and see what the rest of the neighborhood looks like. See the view of the train station from up here on the bridge. And like I said, this train station built back in the late 1800s and uh, hasn't changed since, really. They've preserved it as a historical monument. There's a good view of it right there. Very cool, very cool. I also found out while I was in the cafe, did a little more research on my phone, and uh, found out that the... Uh, what I said before about Coughlin buying this land, that's not exactly true. So the Mitre Railroad bought the land and Coughlin was a, uh, the architect, I guess, or engineer who designed the, uh, the train station. And so they named it after him. Flip it around. Man, look at this. Look at this little intersection here. Cobblestone streets. It's like a little restaurant on the corner. 
another one over there. This this amazing house. Wow, look at that thing. Jeez. I mean, look at look look down that street. Right? Yeah. Very cool neighborhood. Very cool neighborhood. Little little mini slice of England right here. Hola, buen día. More houses of very, very interesting architecture style. I mean, look at this. It's very cool. Very cool, very different. Very different from uh, from other places, other neighborhoods we've been to so far. Has its own sort of vibe, its own feeling going on. Hola, buen día. Hola. And uh, it's just very, like I said before, a very cool thing about Buenos Aires. Because the city is so old, and because the neighborhoods have popped up, um, you know, over the years, they, they all look so different. They all have their own character, and they all have their own sort of history. You know, this place originally was not part of Buenos Aires. It was a suburb when it popped up, and it was later in, I think, like the 1960s, sort of annexed into Buenos Aires and became part of it. Look at that building on the corner. So, what was originally a little sort of town on its own has now become part of Buenos Aires proper, which uh, is pretty cool, pretty cool. Anyway, we can keep poking around and if I see any other really interesting architecture, I'm gonna take a look for sure. And let's you take a look as well. Um, I just want to walk around the neighborhood and uh, don't want to burn uh, too much uh, too much more of the camera battery. Unfortunately, when we went out today, I realized my, uh, my battery was only about half charged. So, um, so let's just take a look around. And like I said, if I see anything else interesting, you'll be the first to know. Came to the corner here. There's a, like a bar on the corner. But behind it, there's this huge like chimney or smokestack or something. And uh, I don't know what it is, but it looks like it's pretty close. So I think uh, I think we should uh, we should walk over and see what it is, right? Yeah, let's do it. We'll walk over and see what it is. So I went around the block. This is about as close as I can get to this thing. I still don't know what it is, but it's like in the middle of the block. So I'm guessing it's on someone's property. I think you'd probably have to go through this gate to get in there. Hold on, let me see if I can lift the camera up and maybe we can just like, I, I can't actually see over this gate, but you can see what that building is. Huh. Some sort of old industrial building, I imagine. Huh. It's very cool, whatever it is. Very cool old, uh, you know, Gilded Age, turn of the century looking smokestack, which uh, is now on someone's property, I guess. They have like a cool, it's it's like a like a decorative feature in someone's backyard now, which is pretty cool, I guess. I mean, it goes goes along well with this neighborhood, and this neighborhood, I gotta say, um, I don't know if it's a super expensive neighborhood to live in, but I'm guessing it probably is, cause. It's really nice and uh, it seems like a very safe neighborhood. I'm walking around. I feel like totally, totally safe. Not sketchy at all, this neighborhood. It's also like relatively clean uh, in like the Buenos Aires sense. Buenos Aires is a little bit, a little bit grimy uh, of a city, but like in a Buenos Aires sense, it's a pretty cool, uh, it's a pretty cool neighborhood. There's the uh, bar that we saw. Very cool. All right. Well, we said if we wanted, to see, if we saw anything else interesting, we would show it. We saw that giant smokestack. Still have no idea what it is. I guess we can look it up later. 
at some point, see if we can get a little more information on it. Uh, and when I do that, of course, I'll probably like pause the video like right here. So there, we probably just cut in a little more information on whatever that thing is. And uh, that's pretty good. I think we've seen a good amount of this neighborhood and I think it's probably about time to head back to the train station and we'll head back, back on into the uh, center of the city. And, uh, and from there, I think that'll be it for the video. We wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about the long and storied relationship between Argentina and Great Britain, the history of uh, not just the government's relationships with each other, but uh, you know the people, the immigration, and, uh, and things like that. And I think we did. It's a very interesting relationship, very long, very interesting, and uh, it continues. It continues to this day, and it's going to be even more interesting and. Um, who knows? Who knows where it'll go from here? Uh, like I said before, it's a bit strained uh, over the uh, Malvinas, um, the Falkland Islands, and uh, uh, who knows where that's going to go, or if that will, you know, in, in my lifetime, ever become something that the two nations can, you know, come to an agreement, settle. But uh, we'll see. I guess we'll see. Anyway, head back to the train station, and. Uh, we will see you all in the next video.